Before we turn over to Tina, I did, and Karen, you're fine. I, I, I didn't want to cut short the great discussion or comments that we had coming in on the chat pod. I think, um, you know, that sort of just feeds into this facilitated discussion that we're going to have now with Tina and also Catherine helping to lead us. Um, so, you know, we have time set aside later this afternoon for a local agency roundtable. Uh, we didn't have as many local agencies sort of sign up to give sort of, you know, prepared presentations as we had thought. So we were definitely good on time. It's um, probably a good point now just to put out there for any of our um, RTPOs or MPOs or COGS, uh, if you have examples uh, to share that you'd like to discuss and you didn't get a chance to email us beforehand to let us know that you wanted a couple of minutes just to talk about that, um, you know, just be prepared when we sort of open things up and invite you to speak, you know, be prepared just to unmute and, and talk to everyone. So I just wanted to put that out there for our session later this morning. Um, and then uh, now I will turn things over to Tina. And, and I know, Tina, you've probably been also monitoring the chat. So there are things in here already, I think, that will contribute to the discussion. But I will happily turn things over to you. Thanks, Tina. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before I get started, I want to say that I really appreciate Carolyn in your presentation. Carolyn and I started discussing equity in Title VI over a year ago. And, and so I'm really happy that you're able to talk to my audience because I work in the Massachusetts division. I lived in Vermont for six years and I'm familiar with New Hampshire. We had a discussion with Jay, the executive directors of New Hampshire. So it feels as though everyone is struggling with this issue. So I'm really glad that everyone's together and is addressing it. And having lived in Vermont for six years, Jay, you're absolutely right about the dump. You know, it just comes back to you. That's right, it's, it's different, you know, and that's what we do, you know, as Vermonters. I moved in the middle of the pandemic to Massachusetts to be closer to my adult children in New Jersey, but I'm still very much involved with the New York, New England states and the issues that are impacting them. And many times when we have discussions on a national level, I'm always saying, what about us? What about the rural communities? How do we fit into this picture? And so I'm really glad that we're coming together to share those ideas and best practices. Now, with that being said, I'm not a national expert on Title VI. You know, that is not what I do, but I do work closely with the MPOs and the RPCs in the local area. And so I know what your struggles are. So I'm really, really happy. As you can tell during the discussion, my face was lighting up. It's like, yes, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So but without further ado, I'm going to ask um, Catherine Otto. She agreed to assist me with the Mentimeter, which involves engagement of everyone. If you're not familiar with Mentimeter, it is a really effective tool in polling the audience and getting your feedback. And so, um, Catherine, would you like to give a, and um, there's something I'm familiar with having worked closely with VTrans. So Catherine, would you like to give a further explanation of the options available with Mentimeter? Yes, so um, you should be able to see my screen right now. So the way Mentimeter works is it's basically an online poll, um, a survey. It's just you can do it in real time. So what you'll do is as you're entering information, you'll see it live on the screen as a summary. Um, we have a variety of different ways to ask questions. So you can answer, ask like, um, like firm answers. So you just like, yes, I'm an MPO or yes, I'm a federal thing. Or you can enter in long responses. Um, we don't have a lot of different question types in this um, this one because the main goal is the facilitated discussion. Um, but all you need to do is if you go to www.menti.com and use the code, which is 910952281. So you can do that either on your phone or if you want to just open a browser screen on your computer. Um, I actually find that's faster for me to write things in. Um, I put that into the chat box um, and we'll get started. Yes. And so what I'm going to do is once we start with the first poll question, it's very simple so you get the hang of things. 
as you're typing in your answers, and you can still type into the chat box um, if that's what you feel most comfortable with. I'll facilitate some of the answers. I may ask you to elaborate on your response or comment on what I've seen in, in the Mentimeter. Okay, so let's get started. Can you give me the first slide, Catherine? What type of organization do you represent? And please type your response in Mentimeter so we can gauge. Very nice. Okay, we got lots of state DLTs. MPOs are present. Thank you so much for that. And, you know, many times I interact, you know, I deal directly with the state DOT when it comes to Title VI issues. Um, but many times I'm involved in MPO certifications, particularly in Massachusetts. Okay, so thank you for that. Next slide, next poll, please. Which organization do you represent? Please type that in. Mass DOT, Vermont Agency of Trans Federal Highway. Thank you. The Boston Region MPO is here. Good, good. Connecticut DOT. Let me see, am I missing it? Addison County RPC. Great. Great. Very good. Do I see, I'm looking more, I see main DOT. Good, regional planning commissions. So we have a nice mixture here. So since we have such a nice mixture, I'm gonna be looking for res responses that impact your outreach. And feel free, you know, we're here to help you. So there's no wrong answer when it comes to this. This is the forum for you. Great. Great, I'll give you a few more minutes to continue to type in. Berkshire Regional Planning Commission is very good. Chittenden County, my friends in Chittenden County. I lived in Burlington, Vermont for six years uh, and I know the work that they do there. Very good. Very nice. Main DOT. Okay, we've captured that information, it looks like. Let's go on to the next slide, the next poll. Identify one or two traditionally underserved groups or communities within your jurisdiction. Now remember, Carolyn went over EJ and Title VI communities. Don't be shy. LEP populations, LEP, elderly, Spanish, that's right. Persons with disabilities. Immigrant, nice. Yes, this is true. This is true. There's lots of struggle with outreach. And that's what I want to talk about. Some of the struggles you may have with outreach. Um, let's talk a little bit about EJ communities. Refugees, that's right. Name of the English, right. Kate Reed, the refugee population. Yes, there's a growing um, refugee population in the northern states. And I think that presents a challenge. I've heard that over and over. And how do we address that? And can I throw out to, with people while you're typing in and keeping in mind when you're looking at an EJ community, EJ communities, well, they're they're defined now a little bit broader, but they're like five communities specifically that you're you're looking at. And I wanted to know, um, are there any of those specific EJ communities, <clears throat> excuse me, that are out there? Um, so what we may be talking about is um, very specifically of those categories. Um, African-American. Right, go ahead. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Black or African-American, very specific, type that in there. Hispanic, Asian-American, American Indian or Alaskan Native, 
or native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. So it's OK to type those in there because when you're doing your EJ analysis, you have to identify which organization. You can't just say minority population. Mm -hmm. Great, because your outreach will look different from a black or African-American population than maybe a Native American population. The outreach, how you would reach me and how you'd reach a Native uh, Indian is probably not going to be the same. Right. So you want to make sure that you can identify those specific populations within your community. Mm hmm. Okay, thank you for that, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the struggle as well, and I see it when I'm involved with um, certification reviews. I go, who? Who are you talking about? My needs, my particular needs as a minority or African American female, are different from someone that may be of Latino background, or the outreach effort to reach me would be different from someone who's Native American. Right. Okay. All right, we've captured that. What strategies are most effective for stakeholders of different demographics? And I see there's some questions in the chat pod as well. Let's talk about strategies, whatever you use. What have you found to be effective? I know Betsy mentioned earlier when she, I think it was the bike project. She said she didn't expect to get the results that she did. You just never know. Direct mail, local media. It depends on the demographics. That's right. Social media. ESL classes. That is excellent. That is excellent. And that's when you can go to the particular group and reach out to them. I, I've heard that in the past. I've seen that in certification reviews. There's one thing I have to add to um, Carolyn's excellent presentation. You're doing that outreach, please document it, please. Because many times when I'm involved in sort of, I'm looking for documentation that this was done. And it doesn't matter, okay, maybe it did not hit the target that you were looking for, but the fact that you had the analysis done and went out for the certification, you did the public outreach, um, document it. You just never know. You just never know how that practice can turn into a best practice. Okay. So, um, Tina, I just wanted to point it out, and and I think if you look on the left hand side there, you know, in a little red box, it says rural and elderly male exclamation point. So there, we had a comment from Scott Bushy in the uh, the, the chat pod. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this question of what strategies are most effective for stakeholders of different demographics. I think he sort of got to this point in a slightly different way in in talking about a, a strategy that was not effective that he found for their elderly, older populations that were not computer savvy and they couldn't attend a virtual meeting. And so they dialed in on the phone, but then they couldn't see the graphics and they felt left out. And you know, it's, it's not just the elderly population that may not be able to see the graphics. There may be the visually impaired. Um, so mm -hmm. we definitely need to keep in mind that we're trying to serve multiple or engage with multiple different populations here. And we can't rely just on one tool or technique. We always have to check back in to make sure we are uh, you know, reaching the, those people that we need to reach. And um, you know, he said that the senior community really wanted to have a face-to-face -face discussion with the project staff. And, you know, I think that is one of the main reasons why the Federal Highway Administration con continues to emphasize the importance of in-person engagement, even if you're going to enhance that with the virtual tools, um, you know, the VPI is not the not the be all and end all of mm -hmm. public engagement, you know, it's it, you can't rely on that um, solely. So I thought that was a really important point to bring up. Thank you. That is, um, I saw something in Mentimeter and it said reaching leaders, groups of specific communities to strategize best, me best methods. Do you want to expand on that comment, whoever typed that in? Because that's really effective. 
Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my name is Rachel Scudder. I'm a planner at the Mount Scutney Regional Commission. Um, Hi. Um, and <laughs> um, basically, you know, whatever um, group that you're trying to reach, say you're trying to reach the African American community, maybe you go to the local, you know, Black Lives Matter group um, and you strategize with them the best method to reach um, those people. Um, so. mm -hmm. And yeah. I'd like to expound on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and she's correct. Thank you for that. Um, going to um, a church also, churches also is, is typically where African-American, mm -hmm. you would be able to, to reach an African-American population, um, maybe a Black Lives Matter group, but you might pick up a different group of people if you go to like the, lo the local um, church center is, is where you will meet them. I was in a meeting and that's a and that's a very good observation as well. I was at another um, forum and it was a, it was a high percentage of Native American population. And they were like, you know, we've tried everything. Flyers, we went to the store, we handed them out flyers, but they never talked to the community elders. <laughs> and until they actually understood that until you talk to the community elders in the group, you're not going to get very far. You really aren't. So that that was an excellent comment um, to, to bring out. So thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Tutina, because I wanted to know who said that as, as well. And, and I like that. You have mm -hmm. to, you know, go to, to places like that, you know, Black Lives Matter groups, churches for African-American people. Don't bypass the elders if you have yes. a, if you know you have a Native American population. Um, please don't bypass the elders in the community. You just, they just won't even bother talking to you. Mm -hmm. and, and Carolyn, I love it when great minds come together because that's exactly what I was going to say. If you want to reach, get my interest, contact the leader of my church mm -hmm. because he has an excellent forum. We'll listen, you know, and I've seen certain occasions where um, the pastor of my church, even though he's in New Jersey, will host a local presenter to talk about an issue. And that is a perfect forum to do so. It is. Uh, yeah. So that's great. And that addresses the trust issue I saw mm -hmm. come up on the screen. Mm -hmm. Um most of the time, most underserved communities, EJ communities, um, have trust issues with federal government because it's, it's a historic, systematic issue that will take me another 30 minutes to talk about. But when you can partner with someone in the community, a community leader or group that they actually trust, whatever group it is, that helps you get your message across um, to that population, whether it's Somalian or not. And I will throw out one thing, um, because I am, I'm going to have to leave, is that you will, you will hear us talk about EJ community, underserved communities, and that kind of thing. Is there a difference? Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about an EJ community, you are specifically talking about minority and low income. And those five categories of minority, which, you know, I kind of read off before and, and I'll read off again, and, you know, if, if you, I don't, well, I don't want to take up the time, but minority, Native American, Hope Island, Pacific, or, you know, those five categories. Underserved communities could be anyone outside of that group. And they have expanded the EJ population um, in a new executive order. But say, for example, <clears throat> a Somalian population is not defined and, and this is a huge population in like Minnesota, but a Somalian population is not defined in environmental justice. However, they would be defined as an underserved community. That's typically left out of the public involvement process. Well, we don't know how to reach them. You know, their English may be broken, but you know, I guarantee you if you text something or, or you had a way for, to meet them or to reach them virtually, they will want to participate and can participate within the meeting. So um, when you say underserved community, it may be different from an EJ community. It might just be, um, it could just be elderly, LEP. Um, and, you know, that may fall under Title VI, but, you know, when you say EJ, sometimes Title VI and underserved, it's, it may not always be the same populations. EJ is very specific to a certain population of people. Underserved is all communities that have been traditionally overlooked, bypassed, or overburdened, which means they've basically borne the burden for all of these expensive highways that we have running around um, because we've moved them, raised them to the ground. You got to go. Here's a buck. Get out kind of thing. 
So I'm very kind of. I know it's not funny, but traditionally that's what occurred. Carolyn, yes. I know you can't stick around for the entire presentation, but what about um, low income and single mothers? Because I know lots of single mothers are struggling in particular, I can't say particularly in rural areas, but there's a pocket of the population that are low income and struggling. So would that count as um, yes. underserved? As underserved, as underserved populations, because typically low income yes. single mothers are those that are of the first where um, if that's where you're living or if there's like a population or a particular pocket of, mm -hmm. of people that are on welfare or low income and single moms, mm -hmm. I guarantee you their homes are going first. If it's near a road, they mm -hmm. will be we have targeted that population in the past and it's just something that we have to accept. And I think part of doing a, a good outreach, public and virtual, in person, is to understand the things that we've done to the community. We target them first because mm -hmm. they have no voice. Mm -hmm. You know, honestly, in our community, you know, it's just difficult for women to have a voice. And you're talking about a single woman. And now you're talking about a single woman that's unmarried. Now you're talking right. about a single woman that's unmarried with children. Single that's woman right. unmarried with children that's poor. Yeah. Yeah, that is a targeted community that we typically do not listen to, no matter what color you are, no matter what race you are. So that would be considered an underserved population that you need to make sure, yes, we are understanding your needs. We're understanding the fact that you may need a particular type of service. Say, for example, it could be a bus service that runs on a time that's convenient for you because you may not have access to a car or a carpool. Right. Or, or these types of things. So you need to get their information as well. That's part of we all have a voice and that needs to be understood um, when you're developing your outreach plan. How can I make sure that I reach this particular um, segment of the population? They may not be part of that mom's group that I mentioned before, but you might, you, you we need to make sure that we are reaching them. Thank you for that. Because I've seen that and I'm aware that Vermont is doing some work in that area as well. And I just thought I should bring that up because many times when I speak to groups and I say I'm a civil rights specialist, I think I'm covering everyone. It's not just minority populations. And I know there's a struggle in certain areas where it's single moms trying to make ends meet. And I don't want them to be left out no matter what their race is. Okay. So. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay. Any questions we have, we'll forward to you later. Sounds <laughs> great. <laughs> All right, thank you, Kat. We've gotten lots of good information in here. Let's see the next slide, please. What is your biggest challenge with engaging underserved communities, virtually or in person? And, and I asked that question because I know you are the experts with analyzing the community within your jurisdiction. And then many times I see there is a challenge, there's a gap, and I, I'd like to find out more about that gap. Someone typed in time constraints. Okay. I'm really interested in hearing that part of the discussion. So when I'm part of a, a MPO certification, you know, there's a limited amount of time where we talk about Title VI and LEP and so forth. And I recognize that many times there is activity in that area, but it's just not expanded upon, depending on the area. And I know many of the smaller um, RPCs or MPOs may not necessarily have the staff. And so that's why I'm asked, that's where that question came from. Okay, very good. So lack of connections. In the local community. And then also I heard Carolyn mention that as part of the process, the analysis is required uh, to identify these particular groups or demographic groups. Um, and I just haven't seen a lot of a lot of the activity expanded in that regard. Okay. So lack of connections and we can we can provide assistance in that area and time constraints. Okay, great. Good, okay, thank you for that. 
What are important considerations to ensure virtual meetings are accessible for people who need special accommodations? And I think, Jay, you had a question on that um, last week regarding uh, LEP communities. Yeah, and translation specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've um, come across that a number of times, and especially in the certification reviews as to what is acceptable translation. I've seen um, a button on the website that can translate vital documents. Um, I've heard of people engaging others or hiring a translator. I knew there was a significant outreach event in Burlington where they had several translators on staff, not on staff, that attended that particular meeting to make sure that the community was, the community needs were addressed. LEP closed captioning, a survey beforehand to find what the needs are. That's great, that's great. Broadband issues. Um, I saw that twice. You know, Tina, in terms of having a survey uh, to find out what your community needs, I think mm -hmm. Kate White had made a comment that she likes attending community partners um, events to know what their priorities are before she plans to host an outreach activity. Um, and I think that's also a great way to sort of figure out how, you know, what type of engagement your community would best respond to or what they would need. And I know that there are, I think, I'm not sure if it was Burlington or somewhere in Maine where they hired community liaisons, for lack of a better word, or ambassadors, which were representative of an underserved community to involve them in, in the discussions um, can anyone elaborate on that? Is it, um, was it Chittenden County or I thought it was someplace in Maine? Brian, thank you, Brian. Please feel free to open your mic and expound on that. Sure. Brian Davis. Um, my name is Brian Davis. I'm a transportation planner at the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. We serve Chittenden County, the greater Burlington metro area in Vermont. Um, there's a project, uh, the Winooski Transportation Plan, a few mm -hmm. years ago in the city of Winooski, which is, I believe it's the most dense, it's very small, one square mile, most dense, racially diverse, um, income, income diverse. And as a part of that, um, the project team did work with um, some local interpreters, really some young younger folks to go out into the community, um, speak in in native languages uh, because there are so many languages spoken, particularly in Winooski, but in our region because of the refugee resettlement program. Um, and it was a great way for our organization to develop those relationships with different people, uh, but also engage the younger people in in the outreach and different communities and, and events. So. Um, that was a good lesson learned for us going forward. Thank you for that, Brian. I remember reading about it and I was just, you know, I get excited about these things. So that was that was one of the things I was really excited about, um, having the young people involved in that discussion. Um, that was great. And then I think it was Wanda that typed in Portland has a program, Portland, Maine. Is anyone from Portland on the call today? You don't have to be shy. Yeah, maybe you'll hear more about that later, but I do remember reading about Portland, Maine, and I think it was during um, a presentation in Massachusetts where I heard that they had a best practice out there. So it's worth talking about. Any practices that you may have involving reaching underserved communities, it's, it's good to share about share those things in this forum. So maybe I later on. A, uh -huh. I see a hand raised from Kevin. So go ahead, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks, Lana. Yeah, just a point I wanted to make um, related to some of the comments in the chat, which are great, and keep them coming, everybody. 
Um, I think sometimes, and it's kind of indicative of some of the responses I'm seeing. I think sometimes we get, uh, when we think of virtual public involvement, we sometimes only think about those live online meetings, which of course uh, have become much more common over the last year and a half uh, as, as we were unable to have in-person meetings. But I just wanted to remind everyone that there's a lot of other VPI strategies out there beyond just those live virtual meetings. You know, Carolyn highlighted some of those earlier, but that it can include, you know, developing like meeting materials and that kind of go at your own pace website based meeting approach. You know, those can be like fancy with like a digital meeting room and people can kind of walk through it like they're in the room or more of a traditional website like the Almo area and PO approach that was shown. Um, and then there's a lot of other tools, <clears throat> strategies like telephone town halls and uh, map based tools that some people mentioned earlier. So I just want us to remember about those other techniques as well, because it's pretty unlikely that any one tool or strategy that we choose mm -hmm. is going to meet everyone's needs. Uh, that was the case before VPI was even really on the scene, but it's it's you know, even more so the case, I think, as we've added VPI to our toolbox. So just want to encourage people to be thinking about things from that perspective as well. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Kevin. Some of the VPI tools that we highlight sort of in the broad eight broad categories um, and even some newer ones really lend themselves well to being used at in-person meetings. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a survey that you load up onto tablets, um, you know, it doesn't matter so much whether your community is comfortable using those tablets or not, because you can be there with them, you know, whether it's at the public meeting or at the fair or farmer's market, you can be there to help them, you know, fill out that form. It makes it easier for you on the back end in terms of collating and processing the survey, but, um, you know, it's it's used in person. Same thing with some of these, uh, you know, design visualizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can put a beautiful rendering or or three D sort of fly through of a, a a project plan onto your website. But you know, how much more effective would that be if you talked through it at an in person meeting? So we can definitely sort of combine and creatively use these different tools, not just leaving people on their own to digest and work through it, but to incorporate it into a livelier, more engaging in-person meeting. Yeah, so thank you for that. So just two things I wanna mention before I move forward is that uh, Greg Slipsinski just typed in the chat pot about the mobility liaisons, and that's exactly what I was referring to, Greg, so thank you for that. Um, he put it in the chat pot for everyone to take a look at that. The other thing I wanna mention is that the comment on broadband is screaming. So let's talk about broadband and access to broadband. Would somebody like to chime in on that? Looks like it was typed in multiple times. Access to broadband. Let's talk about it. Is that it? <laughs> Yes, yeah. Well, I don't hear any comments on broadband. I do know that cell phones, there are limitations to access to cell phones or, or broadband. I do recognize that having lived in Vermont and spending lots of time in the New England states. Um, I know there's discussions on expanding on that, but then it's sort of like with um, what was mentioned earlier, you don't have to rely on one tool. It's not one size fits all. There are multiple ways to reach targeted audiences. Um, I really appreciate the reference to French Front Porch Forum. I remember reading that on a regular basis. Um, that is a really excellent tool um, that's been successful in getting information out there. Um, those public meetings or reaching out to um, certain areas, in-person meetings, um, it is appropriate, and particularly where there is limited broadband or access to broadband. Okay. Um, go ahead. Oh, Tina, related to um, the broadband access, I, I just wanted to mention that the National Telecommunications and Information Administration uh, just earlier this 
this year, I think it was last month actually in June, released the new public, publicly available digital map that sort of displays key indicators of broadband needs across the country. And so um, I, I just wanted to put the link in there as a resource for folks to take a look at. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Someone asked, there was a question in the chat pod, and forgive me if I missed something there. I think it was about funding for the mobility liaisons. But some MPLs have hired community based organizations or nonprofits to assist with gaining input from underserved communities. Yes. That is, I, did, that yeah, is I, I was helping trying to kind of respond to that comment, okay, um, just pointing out that, um, that one example we're aware of is the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning has has taken that strategy uh, and, and um, you can hear more about that in a recording of a previous webinar. I put the link in the in the chat. Thank you so much for that, Kevin. I also okay. see a hand, hand raised from James, James Vaya. Yes. yes. Hello, is my is my microphone working? Yes, yes. It is. Oh, OK, yeah, so I, I had just made a comment based on the, the Portland Seacog uh, 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 relative to these li liaisons. It's a great idea because, uh, you know, one of the things we see is just uh, a, a the, the 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 divide between the understanding of staff and and the needs mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, LEP or minority or low income populations. And and uh, B their their capacity to participate in these things, right? Like they have more immediate needs, like how how am I going to pay the rent, or I got to mm -hmm. go get groceries, or I got to mm -hmm. pick up kids from daycare, and so their capacity to participate in sort of the traditional planning methods is so limited that uh, a liaison kind of can can fill the gaps where it would take a tremendous amount of effort from us, but a liaison might might be very effective. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that comment, James. You're absolutely right. I've seen that liaisons are effective in reaching um, underserved populations. Um, I've seen it in Vermont and I've heard about it in Maine and in other parts of the country. So that is a, a great tool. Okay. Lots of great comments. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, so now we're gonna move to the, I think it's the last slide. Identify a source, organizational method, which proved beneficial in engaging underserved. I think we just answered that question. What has been successful or has helped you? Please share that information by typing that in. Well, I think I can, um, so as folks are responding here, it's something that mm -hmm. Scott Collins put into the chat sort of directly addresses this. So he's found that, you know, having both uh, on, demand, on demand meetings mm -hmm. versus just having the live virtual meetings can help from addressing a, a broadband, um, you know, maybe access issue. So if, if you don't have broadband and you can't engage in a live virtual meeting for whatever reason, having something that's on demand that may be, you know, pre-recorded um, that you can access in your own time allows you the flexibility to, you know, if you need to go to the public library to access that, um, you know, a reliable internet connection, you can do that if you, you know, need to go over to a friend's house to access it, whatever it may be. So yeah, having that additional flexibility for people um, can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Someone typed in moving to virtual engagement tools, recently used a tool called Co-Urbanize, which is effective in garnering engagement. Um, can you elaborate on that? Whoever typed that in? So that, uh, that, sounds really interesting. that was you? That, yeah, that was me again. Yeah, so uh, the the RPC uh, administered a uh, a a U.S. Uh, New Hampshire DOT funded or well, federal highway funded project looking at transit oriented development for our city center, uh, which mm -hmm. deals with a lot of the populations we're talking about today. And as a 
it, 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 as part of the scope, we had a requirement for an interactive web page uh, in which input could be provided both in mapping tools and surveys and others. And uh, so we ended up using this co-urbanized tool to uh, to implement the public engagement process, the, the virtual element of the public nice. engagement process and incorporated it with in person. It was it was highly effective. I'll uh, I'll put a link in the chat box so people can take a Thank look at it. That. That's really fantastic. And that's exactly what I was hoping to gain from facilitating this discussion because as i mentioned earlier i have discussions individually um and i know that you know for the new york new england states i i cover new york new england states i'm the um team leader so pardon me for referencing new york but the new england states are struggling with certain issues and i just thought it would be helpful that we come together and talk about them and share these best practices um you can continue typing in your responses in the chat pod, or I mean in, in the Mentimeter. I just wanted to thank Catherine Otto for assisting with the Mentimeter when I, they just, I know VTrans does a fantastic job with um, meetings and using the tool. And as Catherine and I were collaborating, we found out we had so much in common. We both went to school in New Jersey. We have family in New Jersey. We lived in Connecticut and she's currently in Vermont. And you just never know the commonalities you may have, even with your targeted audience, until you break down some of those barriers and engage them in discussions. You'll find that everybody, as it's Carolyn mentioned, they want to know how does this project impact me? Um, how does this impact my neighborhood? How will this impact my commute? Um, what will happen to my children as a result of it? What will happen to my home that I own or where I'm currently renting? And so people generally want to see when you're involved in these engagements, what's in it? How does it impact them personally? And you can do it through VPI, in-person engagement, the front punk, front porch forum, the dump going out, um, any place where people congregate as a community and you are the experts in that area you know what the jurisdiction looks like what the demographics look like um, so i encourage you to continue to drill down and and make sure that you document your outreach efforts um, there's lots of good information i want to thank you for your time and catherine you can put up the final slide because we're just about at 10 17. How can we provide assistance to you? So I've asked a lot of good questions. You've been really helpful. If there is something that we have not quite hit the mark on, please, by all means, type the information in the chat pod or reach out to the coordinators of this um, webinar series because we're really here to try to help you get to where you need to be. Um, I have to say that many times I'm on the other side of the table during the certification reviews and, and that's a little different, but this particular webinar is designed to provide assistance to you and our audience and our targeted audiences. And that includes everyone, as you can see. So I want to thank you for your time, um, but please feel free to continue to type in how we can provide assistance to you. And Tina, as we're seeing these comments roll in, I wanted to thank you for your time. Um, you know, this has been a great discussion. Uh, even, even though I sort of uh, talk with, engage with these types of topics, um, you know, almost daily, uh, I still learn a lot from the discussion. And um, I'd never used the Mentimeter tool before. So it was great to have the opportunity to see how that worked as well. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank you. And thank thank Catherine. Thank you, Catherine, also for your assistance in in guiding this Mentimeter led discussion. OK. All right. So then that wraps up our presentation. Like I said, we, we're going to take down the Mentimeter slide and turn it back over. But as I said, please reach out to us if there's any way we can help you get to where you need to be. Someone said funding. That's a good so money is always an issue, right? <laughs> yes. So thank you for your time, everyone. I really appreciate your engagement in this discussion. I, as I was mentioned earlier, I am a transportation, self-proclaimed transportation geek. I say, what does that mean? That means I actually ride 
from point A, point B, in public transportation, just to see the connections and what kind of what is going on and where the gaps are. I know I need to get a light, but. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. Um, Catherine, you can put up the final slide if everyone's finished and putting the information. Thank you once again. And Lana, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. So uh, we're about to take a break. Uh, we'll, we'll give everyone a 15 minute break.